Hello, thank you for joining me today and I hope you're enjoying the conference. I'm Jess Posgate. I'm the Projects Coordinator for Our Digital World, a not-for-profit organization based in Ontario. I, would, I work virtually from Prince Edward County, Ontario, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional lands of the St. Lawrence Iroquois, Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee nations, and that as a descendant of Scottish farmers in Ontario, I am keenly aware of my settler history and now strive to live on and work this land in the spirit of regeneration. Today I want to talk about inconvenient exposures online. At Our Digital World, we work with organizations to bring their community history and research collections online for public discovery. Our philosophy is to make public information publicly accessible, but there are some instances where we realize that these collections sometimes have personal and political impact and not necessarily in a good way. First, I want to take you through a scenario of personal information and local history. I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with this kind of narrative. A young couple have a child, a daughter, in 1964. The father proudly walks down to the local newspaper office to put in an announcement in the week, next week's paper. He wants his friends and family to know, and it's also a point of pride to announce a healthy new member of the family. Over the newspaper counter, he faithfully provides his name and his wife's, their daughter's names, let's call her Kathy Wells, and her weight, maybe her older siblings' names, and the date of birth. From today's standpoint, you can already see some of the troublesome details being shared here. But in 1964, there were not such worries. The weekly newspaper was printed and delivered around the community, stuffed into mailboxes along rural routes, and shared over drinks at the local cafes and bars. Oh look, so-and-so had a baby girl. How, how nice! A copy goes to the local library for public use and is stored for preservation. Thirty years later, the library is moving to a new building or needs room for a new youth space and raises the funds to have all the old newspapers microfilmed. The footprint for storage is reduced, the bulky microfilm reader is a technological masterpiece, and the storage room is emptied. <clears throat> People from the community come into the library to browse through the microfilm newspapers, looking for history on their relatives, their heritage homes, or for school projects. Local newspaper staff use the microfilms to look back on crimes or disasters or honors that can be dragged out or celebrated as part of current events or in their research into larger stories. The library keeps adding annual runs of the local newspaper to the microfilm cabinet. The collection grows. The 21st century comes and the internet. The library realizes the value of making their community history collection available online and the local newspaper on microfilm is digitized along with a birth marriage and death index that volunteers have been compiling over the years. The resulting files and index go up in a public site and are searched by international search engines like Google. Now here we are in 2014, let's say, and one day, through no fault of her own, Kathy Wells finds herself downsized out of her job in an insurance film, but she isn't quite able to retire yet, so she sets out to find another position in the field. She has a good career behind her, and her resume reflects this. She's invited to multiple interviews, but the positions keep slipping away. According to her colleagues in the field, the positions are being offered to younger candidates. She dyes her hair, has fresh-looking skin, and is in good shape. While she has quite a few years of work experience, her resume doesn't include her age. A colleague suggests that she do a vanity search by searching her own name and using her maiden name, the one that she's reclaimed after her divorce. Kathy Wells, like many people, she's since moved away from her hometown and lost her parents, but following the tradition of announcing all family milestones in the local paper, her sister's marriage, the births of her children, her brother's graduation, Kathy's first marriage, she also posts her parents' death notices. She even includes suggested donations to services that match her parents' values. Other news items record her brother's one-time brush with some bad apples her sister's involvement with the Women's Institute, basically anything newsworthy. So when Kathy does her vanity search, every one of these records comes up, and her history is totally exposed. So she writes to the local library. In the immediate, Kathy's experiencing ageism in her field and realizes that having her birth date available online means that anyone can know her age. This is the record that she's asked to have taken down from the online news collection. 
But other news, other records, can lead to more serious problems. It might be that her first marriage resulted in violence and her fleeing and hiding until she obtained her divorce and returned to her maiden name, but the newspaper item still binds her to that man and makes her feel vulnerable. Some people also make personal requests for marriage annou announcements to be removed from the public collection, and some people make those requests with their lawyers present. It could be that uh, Kathy's brother, during the stupidity of youth, was named in the local police blotter one week as charged with break and enter theft and property damage. Sure, he had a smart mouth then and ran with the crowd who were also named in the crime, but the week after those charges were laid against him, they were summarily dropped when witnesses put him on a street corner far from the crime. The newspapers moved on, the police blotter fills with other misdemeanors, but no one looks back. And now, when Kathy's brother or his potential employer or a woman he wants to date uh, Google his name, that's what comes back. The cr description of the crime comes up and not the pardon. It is a quandary because we want local history and community heritage collections to be accessible and shared widely. We love that newspapers especially are such a treasure trove of genealogical and historical information about our towns and our townspeople. Having this online means we can make connections. We can draw from collections and records from all over to see a bigger picture or draw a line on a family tree. And this helps us better understand people as individuals as well as the collective history of our communities. It's all fine and good when the objects of our, um, of our research are part of the deeper past of people already dead with the, when their legacy is relatively static. However, as more current material comes online and we are able to find and share information about people who are still living wherever they are, we need to consider the legal and personal implications of the public record and therefore come up with some tactics to handle requests from the public for changes to that public record. Most of the organizations we work with have been very swift to come up with policies for handling personal information requests. Obviously, this pertains to individuals like our Kathy Wells, but not so much to people with larger political or commercial careers and personalities. For newspaper collections, most organizations will accept and act upon written requests for information or record removals. When thinking about writing such a policy, though, if the item names something, something like um, someone being convicted of a crime, would you want to have that expunged from the public record? Would you require a legal request rather than a personal request? These are things to consider as you create your policy. For full text newspaper content, there are a few steps that need to be taken. You can turn off the display of the page entirely, which will affect the presentation of the issue, as well as removing any other news items on that page from the collection. Or you can retract the full text that matches the personal information request, making sure that you have access to every version of the text files running on your system. Using a system like the Vita Digital Collections Toolkit, which is a service of our digital world, you can do things like turn off indexing for the page text for that particular page. Um, this removes all the full text for the page from uh, the index on your Vita site, and it means that it's more difficult for search engines to crawl it and find it, although I'll talk more about that in a minute. And basically what you do then is you're just presenting the image of the page for human browsing. It used to be that just the full text was crawled and indexed for discovery and by search engines, but more recently Google especially has developed an automatic OCR process wherein it can find a PDF page image and will automatically process that page with optical character recognition software so that the text is searchable in Google. So now we work with organizations to do all of the above that we've just talked about, as well as replacing the accompanying PDF file with a P with a dummy PDF. This way the local search site won't return the name or full text from that page, but users can still see the page and read it with their with their human eyes um, if they go to it directly. But when Google calls the site and snatches up the PDF and all it does is it pulls down the dummy file and can only OCR these words. We're sorry this page is not available in PDF. Further to this work in the actual collection, our digital world as the website owner also puts in a removal request with Google. There are two tiers to this. Removal of outdated content for removed or altered content on the web, 
or a legal request can be made directly to Google to remove content with personal or legal issues. We usually employ the outdated content removal workflow after making the changes in the Vita site content. This is done by entering the URL where the content is found, e.g. the PDF that Google made searchable or an image URL. The trick with any of these examples is, is that any written, written requests for information takedown must be accompanied by the URL of the page or pages where the information is located. Now moving away from the Kathy Wells scenario specifically, I wanted to address some other types of documents where personal information is also exposed when it's digitized and made available online. Yearbooks. Where these requests get a little fuzzier is in material that was not intended for broad public dissemination. School records like yearbooks, for example, are created and printed for distribution to a finite group of staff and students and as part of the school's organizational memory. Yearbooks are also a point of pride in community history and some organizations are digitizing these and making them available as online as well. But we have seen personal information removal requests for information in yearbooks. Uh, we had someone who adamantly did not want to be associated with a particular school for whatever reason. We've also seen personal information included in yearbooks from small schools in remote towns where every student's name and phone number or street address was included. In that case, those pages were kept non-public because in many cases, either the students or their parents still use that contact information. The same techniques would be used uh, as for newspapers to remove identifying details and private information from items like yearbooks. Reviewing the items beforehand, though, means the organization can proactively suppress any blatant private information before the items go online and are indexed locally and then by search engines. Organizations like Wilfrid Laurier University will remove student names and or photographs by request after the fact, but they are digitizing and uploading collections of all kinds, including convocation programs, photographs, the school newspaper, news releases, uh, and more after checking for names and contact information. And they have the, um, they have the registrar's support in making that material available online. Other community documents include things like uh, scrapbooks. Um, a great example here in Ontario is the Federated Women's Institutes of Ontario, who have a fastidious approach to privacy and personal information review. Their digitization project covers a massive number of documents and volumes produced by women's institute branches from across the province. One key activity of the women's institutes is to officially record community histories in the Tweedsmere history books, something they've been doing since 1947 and which were intended for public use and circulation. But the uh, women's institute branches also have other documentation stretching back to 1897 since the FWIO's inception. Now, because the majority of the material they have produced is from the last 75 years, much of it includes information about members who are potentially still living or only recently deceased. The FWIO, respecting its members and the fact that the documentation is like that of yearbooks, really meant for local dissemination, they review each document and apply certain rules to ensure a consistent protocol for the release of private information. Items in their collection meant for public dissemination like books, newspaper clippings, plaques, etc. are exempt from privacy restrictions. However, non-exempt items that might need to remain private can include documents with personal addresses, phone numbers, and other contact information of living people, birth dates or birth announcements of living people, membership lists that are less than 50 years old, unless intended for the public record, uh, biographical information about a living person unless otherwise published or permitted for dissemination, and recent photographs of individuals including children unless permission has been received. Generally, the FWIO follows the mandate that minutes and other record books less than 50 years old should remain private and not be put on the website as many contain privacy issues such as membership lists and, those, um, and they keep those full documents. Uh, non-public. Doing this before online publication means they will not be discovered and searchable until they're released. 
The 50-year range is something the FWIO has chosen to follow as a rule of thumb, even though other sources suggest 30 and even 20 lapsed years is sufficient. These kinds of decisions should be made internally and documented to ensure consistent treatment across the collection. This also begs the question of how to include this in the workflow for the future. How will you flag when an item can be made public? Who is going to be delegated to make that change? And similarly, would this affect any policies regarding privacy or personal information requests and whether they would have an expiry date? There is some legislation around this kind of uh, request or these kinds of requests, and this is called the right to be forgotten, but it is not something that's in place in North America, so it's very much a grassroots effort to affect the, the appropriate change by having local policies that make sense for the communities they serve. On the other hand, what if the work that you're doing is to share information that you don't want to be forgotten or suppressed? In, this is the case with many advocacy and solidarity groups who are exposing current and historical conflicts online through controversial collections. We also see politically motivated suppression of information, even here in Canada, when only recently the government decided to release documentation from residential schools saying finally now that they don't need approval from the church. Once those documents are open, there's no question the anguish they will cause, but their exposure also reveals a long part of Canadian history and the shaping of its people. Controversial history is not new, and handling personal attacks is something we're all familiar with. We know that anonymity on the internet is a perfect curtain for haters who shield themselves while targeting groups or individuals whose collections reveal events or beliefs that don't match their own version of the universe. On an individual or social level, we see this in open forums like comments and so on, which with the uh, tool like Vita Toolkit, some will need to be approved before they're made public. But a systematic attack is something our team had never seen until we started working with the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, or HREC. The timing of this seems an amazing coincidence with the current crisis in Ukraine because the Holodomor Digital Collections documents and exposes survivor and witness accounts and photographs of the Ukrainian famine of 1933 to 1934. In their words, the Holodomor was the death through starvation of about 4 million people in Soviet Ukraine, mainly Ukrainian peasants, in a famine caused by the policies of Communist Party and Soviet government authorities headed by Joseph Stalin. Recognized already in 1933 as a great national tragedy by Ukrainians living outside of the Soviet Union, discussion of the famine was proscribed and its occurrence officially denied in the USSR until 1987. This group and others gather, discuss, and disseminate resources for genocide researchers and other scholars. REC has access to an astonishing collection of photographs and correspondence that they wanted to make available online. The collections include a photo directory that presents and describes dozens of photos, storyboards, and photographer biographies. The photos were mostly taken surreptitiously by a few foreign visitors and then smuggled out of the Ukraine and used to publicize the events there. The one domestic photographer, Nikolai Bokan, suffered severe punishment for photographing and publicizing the atrocities he documented. The other main collection of first-hand testimony is captured in the Maniac Letters. This will ultimately amount to about 500 handwritten letters penned in Ukrainian and Russian. The letters are accompanied by transcriptions and translations and describe a host of atrocities and hardship. Freck and ODW have worked together to bring together, bring the material to a public online platform with full text search in Ukrainian, Russian, and English to ensure that their discovery reaches the widest possible audience. So here's an example of one of the Maniac letters, handwritten version, a full transcription that's full text searchable, as well as a translation that is also full text searchable. The impact and response of the release of these collections was immediate. Our analytics show that the collection is being searched and accessed by communities around the globe. These screenshots show the public site access, but according to our team, a number of internal server attacks also started in 2020. Here is the um, geographic uh, referencing for the general audience in 2020 for the photo directory. 
and this is the change in that geolocation information for the year of 2021. And these, uh, this is the digital collections from 2020, and the next slide is the uh, digital collections 2021. The attacks that I've mentioned have largely taken the form of attempts to log in remotely as administrators to our servers. Uh, given that we've always done remote administration, a variety of defenses were already in place, but server security has had to be tightened over the course of the last two years, and so far this has proved sufficient. There have been no signs of successful penetration to the security. But just to illustrate the number of attacks, um, the weekend before last we saw 16 or so attempts per second, which is almost 14,000 attacks on that weekend alone. And in, in 2021, there are over 134 million attempts to get onto our servers. Now we can't absolutely pinpoint the attacks to the Holodomor collections, but we've never been attacked like this before. And the logs do show the originating location of the attacks, so it's hard not to draw conclusions. In conclusion, deciding which collections we want to share used to be based on very practical considerations. Preservation of the original and most popular items, or in the case of a newspaper microfilm, about space, access, and human resources. But as the internet becomes more ubiquitous and tools are more powerful, now we have to consider the larger effects and impacts because of the international reach we can accomplish online. Local or community history has considerable and growing value, and you are the stewards of those unique collections and their contents. By taking some thoughtful steps ahead of any digitization project or collection release, you can manage any and all responses. Engage the community online, yes, and also prepare to keep some things private and to handle requests like the ones I've mentioned. Obviously, in the case of the Holodomor collections, there's no obvious way to change the minds behind a politically motivated systematic attempt to suppress inconvenient history, but it is worth realizing that this is a possibility and recognize the steps that might be, need to be taken to maintain that information online for the rest of the society to access. And that is, in fact, what we are trying to do is provide access. So I encourage you to continue doing so as best you can. So I will thank you now, and um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Feel free to reach out to me. The slides and the presentation will be available, I believe, through the conference website for a few months after the event itself. For your own research, I've provided some links to some of the resources I've accessed to provide the information around um, privacy and personal information online. Um, some of the workflows around Google and removing personal information, as well as some other documentation um, surrounding uh, this kind of material um, and some references to the collections that I made mention of or used as examples so that you can explore them as well. So thank you very much and enjoy the conference.